I'm going to share with you uh, this morning. I'm not going to preach a sermon I'm, as much as I'm going to share a revelation of something that I believe can be a, a it can be a life-changing revelation for many of us this morning. I want to share something with you. It's very personal to me. I'm going to uh, stick my neck out and uh, risk someone thinking I'm half crazy. You know, if you believe the Bible, somebody's going to think you're crazy. If you start living the Bible, they're going to think you're nuts. And if you start telling them that the Bible works, they think you're insane. But I'm telling you, the Bible is God's word and God does not lie and it'll work for us if we'll walk in his word. Amen, somebody? Amen. Amen. Yeah, give the Lord a hand clap. We're going to, I want to share a revelation that'll help you. I want to talk to you this morning about when Jesus shows up. I'm telling you, it's a miracle moment when Jesus shows up in your life. If, if you ever have Jesus show up in your life, I'm telling you, <clears throat> it, it, it'll, it, it's heart stopping it's, it's, it's mind blowing and it's life transforming when the risen Christ shows up in your life it is really really a wonderful something that can happen to you so I want to talk about when Jesus shows up we're going to take our text from John the 14th chapter this is a great passage of scripture it's ch it's chock full of promises from God. And so I want to read it to you starting in verse 15. John 14 verse 15. Listen to the words of Jesus. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father and he'll give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. Listen to what Jesus said, I will come to you. What's he saying? He said, I will show up in your life. Everybody say, he'll show up. He'll show up. That's a promise. He said it right there. I will manifest myself to him. Judas not Iscariot, but the other one we know of as Jude that wrote the book of Jude. Jude said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and we will make our home with him. Again, the promise, we, we, my, the father and me, we will come to him. We will show up. We'll make our home with him. We'll abide with him. We'll live with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine. But he said, it's the fathers who sent me. That's an amazing passage. Again, amazing promises. Spectacular promises. And with a, a sentence or two that are a little uncomfortable for us. You know, he talks about obedience. Everybody look at your neighbor and say that word. Oh, people don't like that word much anymore, but it's still in the Bible. Everybody say to your neighbor, come on, look at them and say obedience. Yeah, see, obedience is still a good thing. And it is a requested thing of God. God requests that you and I obey. How many of you know we got into the mess that this planet got into when Adam chose to disobey God? Oh, there's a blessing on obedience. And so Jesus here is talking to his disciples. And by the way, this message this morning is particularly, specifically for believers, for children of God. It's not for the world. It's for you. Adam preached for the world a while ago. People that are, don't yet have a relationship with God. And, and, I, and I know some people prayed and now they've come into a relationship with God. So now this message is for you. But if a person has no commitment to God and is not a follower of Jesus, Jesus makes them no promises here. This promise is for his children. This promise is for you and for me. He promises to show up in our lives. Oh, how many times I've heard people complain over the past 40 years of my pastoral ministry. Pastor David, the Lord doesn't help me. The Lord's not hearing my prayers. He never shows up for me. He never does anything for me. I can't tell the Lord is even listening. I don't know why the Lord doesn't bless me. I don't know why they got healed and I didn't get healed. I don't know why this doesn't work and that doesn't work and this stuff you preach doesn't work. Oh, how many of you know have, we've heard it and heard it and heard it? And yet Jesus promised. He did. He made a promise. He says, I will show up for you. 
I will show up in your life. Here he makes several statements that are very key, wonderful statements of promise. He, he starts out by saying that he wants us to keep his commandments. He, he tells us that when we keep his commandments, it's a proof of our love for him. He uh, talks about the Holy Spirit will indwell us. He had been with the disciples because he was upon Jesus and they were with Jesus. So they were, they were acquainted with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But he said, hey, better than that, he's going to be on the inside of you as well. He told them that they were going to see him when the world could not see him. I believe he was specifically talking about the experience of his resurrection. You know, he appeared to them after his resurrection and showed himself alive by many infallible proofs, the Bible says. And, and, and they touched him and ate with him and talked with him. And they knew he was alive. And through their testimony, you and I have become believers. And we believe Jesus is alive yet today. Amen, somebody? Come on, say he's alive. Yeah, I'm telling you tonight, uh, today, Jesus is alive, and he has promised to show up in your life. He's not dead, so he can do it. He can show up in our lives. He, he talked about the fact that because he lives, we can live also. In other words, we share in his aliveness. His very life is on the inside of you the moment you're born again. If you prayed that prayer with Adam a moment ago, life came into you, eternal life, everlasting life, the God kind of life. And a life that can give you abundant life in this world that we're living in. He shares his aliveness with his disciples. He said that they would come to perceive, to understand. He promises us the same thing. That we can come into an understanding of our union with God. He said, you're going to know that I am in the Father or in union with, in connection with the Father. And that I'm in connection with you and that you're in connection with me. So in other words, if Jesus is connected to the Father and if he's connected to you and you're connected to him, then you're also connected to the Father. And that's why he can say, the Father and I will, will come and visit you. Would you love for Jesus and his father to come and visit you? Oh, I'll tell you, if he ever does, it'll be heart-stopping. It'll be mind-blowing, and it'll be life-transforming. He's not talking about some lame, vanilla, beige, look, some little ditty kind of nice thought. Some people have reduced religion down to some nice positive thoughts. No, Jesus is promising that in his own physical resurrected body and in his own spiritual essence and presence and in his own reality that he can come to you and show up in your life in a variety of ways. He said, the father and I are going to come. He said, if you'll love me, I will manifest myself to you. The word manifest means to reveal, to exhibit, to disclose, to appear, to make known. It's a multifaceted word. In other words, there's lots of different ways Jesus could make himself real to you. That he can show up in your life. Even, even to, the, to the extent of appearing to you. You know, some people have seen Jesus. I mean, people that are walking around on the planet right now have had open visions of Jesus. He's walked. I know one uh, a man that had been to help mentor me, and he's in heaven now, but he, he shared the testimony of one morning Jesus himself walked into his bedroom. Before he'd even gotten out of bed, Jesus walked in, and he spent all morning with Jesus laying in the floor, crying tears out of his eyes, just basking in the almighty resurrection presence of the Lord Jesus himself. It was a vision, an open vision. Well, that's just what, it happens, but that's one way Jesus can keep this promise. But there's a variety of ways. I think he leaves it a little vague because he can, he can, he can fulfill it in so many different ways. He can show up in our life. And I'm going to tell you something, you need him to show up in your life. In fact, uh, this is what's missing in a lot of modern day Christians is they've never really experienced Jesus much after they were born again. I'm telling you, when you got saved was a glorious moment, but that's not all God has in store for you. He wants to keep on showing up in your life. Some, of, some people are scared to death he will, I, I, you know, they, but he will. He can do it. He promised to show up. Now, he has shown up in my life over the years in various ways. And I'm going to share some things personally. I don't share some of these things hardly very often at all because the truth is I'm sticking my neck out. I'm taking a gamble, but you're his church, and I'm going to trust that 
you'll trust me a little bit. And, but, but bottom line, you can choose to believe my stories or not believe my stories. But I want to share a little bit of my personal testimony about how Jesus has shown up for me. Because I, what I want to do is encourage you to seek his face, claim that promise, and do whatever he tells you to do until he shows up in your life. Because when he begins to show up in your life, your life will change. Your life will change. I remember years ago as I began to serve the Lord, I'd uh, recommitted my life. I'd been born again in my teenage years, and then when I was 21, I, I'd gotten out and into sin and into drugs and drinking and the party life and everything. But I came back to God at 21. I was married soon after that. We had our first child within two years. And uh, man, I was doing everything. I was going to church. I was serving my pastor. I was giving in the offerings. I was living for God. I was being a witness. I was just doing everything I knew to do. And, uh, but uh, I had a supervisor that, that had gotten saved. And man, he, me and I were, he and I were buddies uh, until he decided he didn't want to live saved. He went back to the world. And then when he, uh, as we call it, backslid and went back to the world, all of a sudden, I, be, I, I stopped being his favorite person, and I became his most unfavorite person. And he didn't want me around, and he made it tough on me and ended up losing my job because that supervisor took a dislike to me. Because I represented Jesus, and I was on fire for God, and he was not. And that's how things go. How many of you know sometimes we suffer at the hands of unbelievers? I lost my job. Well, I had a wife. I had a baby to feed. And I, uh, uh, where I grew up, where I lived at that time, Western Kentucky, there were no jobs. The coal miners had gone on strike. The coal miners had gone and gotten all the grocery store jobs and the gas station jobs. And, and man, there was just no jobs to be found. I looked for jobs and applied for jobs and begged people for jobs. And I couldn't find a job. And so I had to work odd jobs. And uh, a friend of mine had an elderly father who needed help around the house because he was too old to do the, the things around the house. And so he hired me for $2 an hour. 1977, $2 an hour. And I did not even get 40 hours a week, but I went as much as he had let me. And I did this and that and the other for him. And one, one day he had me out in the ditch by the highway. He lived right on a big highway. And the ditch was about this deep. And I was cutting weeds in that ditch. And oh, how I would have loved to have had a weed eater, but there was, there was no weed eater. What, I, what he gave me to cut these weeds with, I mean, I'm neck deep in these weeds in this big ditch on the highway. And he gave me what they call a scythe. Anybody know what a scythe is? You ever seen the pictures of the Grim Reaper? You know that big tool he has with the two handles with a big blade? That's a scythe. That's what I had out there cutting weeds. Now, it was about like today in western Kentucky where I was working that day. It was 100 degrees, except it was 100% humidity. And I was out there swinging that blade and trying to cut those weeds. And I was feeling real sorry for myself. I'm just trying to serve the Lord. I got this baby to feed and I lost my job. Man, I'm just, try, I'm just doing the best I can. Why am I, going, why am I going through this? You ever wonder that? Why am I going through I thought when I gave my life to the Lord, it would be wonderful from then on. But no, I'm working like a dog and I'm sweating and I'm, I'm breathing through. I got to need gills to even breathe out here. It's 100% humidity and I'm swinging this thing and I'm working like a dog for $2 an hour. And man, I was feeling sorry for myself. About this time, I'm down in there, I'm cutting weeds. Your, your cars are just whizzing by. I'm right out there in this ditch. And right across the road was a veterinary clinic. And, and from the veterinary clinic came a big brand spanking new red pickup truck. Look like your red pickup truck. Brand spanking new. And in the, in the driver's seat was an old schoolmate of mine. And uh, he worked at the manufacturing plant there in town, and he made good money, and he had bought a brand new red pickup truck. Now, I got to tell you about the car I drove. I drove an old gold Ford that, that it was all, tore up when I got it. And, and, and the, 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 there was something wrong with the starter. When you start it up when, and the engine crank, and you let go of the key, the starter wouldn't quit grinding. It would just keep on grinding and grinding. Now, that's how bad the starter was. And so what I had to do is I had to keep my tire tool handy. I had it there in the floorboard. I'd pop the hood, go around, get in, start it, let go of the key. That starter would be still grinding. I'd pick up the tire pull, run back out there, and I had to hit and bang on that starter <laughs> to get it to stop grinding, you know. And then when it quit, I'd slam the hood, get back, throw my tire tool on the floor, and take off. Now we got transportation. Now here, but here's this kid. He's got him a good job. He's got a brand new pickup truck. It's red. I mean, I, it, it made me see red when I saw it. And on top of that, he wasn't even one of the cool kids in my class. 
I thought I was cool, but he was totally uncool. And as far as I know, he wasn't even trying to serve God. And he, pull, he pulls up and he's looking at me eyeball to eyeball. He looks at me and I look at him and we look at each other. And then he reared back and, and had the biggest belly laugh you've ever seen in your life. That young man laughed at me. And laughed and laughed and laughed at me. Shook his head like, what are you doing, David Brown? And he pulls out on the highway puts the pedal to the metal, squalls those tires, leaves a black streak 30 feet long, takes off in his brand spanking new red pickup truck, just laughing at me all the way. And I'm thinking, oh God, I'm just trying to serve you. My eyes filled with tears. I was so mad at that guy. I wanted to kill him or cuss him or something. <laughs> I can't do that because I'm a Christian. <laughs> but I wanted to. How many of you know as a Christian, you want to do things you're not supposed to do something? I was so humiliated. I was, because my last job, I was a foreman. I was top dog over the crew. And when I lost that job, I lost a lot of money and a lot of esteem. And, a, well, I lost a lot. I'm standing there in that ditch. And I start complaining to God. I said, God, why am I, why? I'm just trying to do my best here. I serve my pastor. I go to church. I give in the offerings. We're starving to death. I'm working for $2 an hour. Why is it? And the Lord spoke to me and he said, do you remember in my word when I told you when they reproach you for the sake of Christ Jesus that you should rejoice and leap for joy? Come on, come on. I said, uh, what? <laughs> Come on, you said that like you ain't, I, I didn't catch that. What'd you say, Lord? Do you remember in my word, it's in Luke's gospel. When I said, when they reproach you, that you, you, are to, you are to rejoice and leap for joy. I said, yeah, yeah, I know that's in there. He said, well, you need to do that. When? Right now. You need to do that right now. What? Yeah, can I tell you something? Playing dumb with God don't work. <laughs> and then that's all he said and I knew what he told me to do and so I said okay I dropped the blade lifted my hands here come the cars I'm, a, I'm in this ditch with my hands up <laughs> acting like a Pentecostal <laughs> Lord I thank you that I'm saved it was hard I didn't want to do that you think I felt like praising God I didn't feel like praising God I felt like killing that guy <laughs> Lord I praise you and I thank you Thank, I want to cuss that guy. Lord, but I thank you and I praise you. And I, so thank you for saving me. I am called to the ministry. We are going to make it. You're going to supply our need. And then I thought about that leaping part. I thought, oh God, okay. And I start to jump. I'm, I literally was jumping in that ditch. I'm jumping up and down. And the more I jumped and the more I praised, the happier I got. I mean, the joy of the Lord came to me. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. I'm running up and down the ditch. Running up. You'll see it again. I'm running up and down the ditch. I'm running up and down the ditch. Say, hallelujah. Woo! Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. I'm saved, baptized in the Holy Ghost. I'm a preacher of the Word of God, and I'm going to make it. Hallelujah. Jesus got in my ditch with me. And I learned something from him that day. If you can't leap in your ditch, you'll never leap out of it. <laughs> Within just a few weeks, I had a real job for more than $2 an hour. It was a whole $4 an hour. Praise God. We were being promoted. Praise the Lord. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. Jesus will come to you. I had this job back then driving an end loader. I'd go up the hill, pick up a bucket of ore. It was a mining operation. Drive the inloaders. Inloaders is like a tractor with a big bucket on the front. I'd, I'd pick up a bucket full of ore, go down the hill, dump it in the bin. We went into a mill where they milled the ore. We were mining up the hill, down the hill. Up the hill, down the hill. That gets old in 15 minutes. <laughs> Eight-hour job, midnight shift, I, all by myself. Up the hill, pick up a bucket, go down the hill, dump the bucket. Go up the hill, get the bucket, go down the hill, dump the bucket. Well, my pastor had been teaching us about praying in our prayer language. 
praying in tongues, praying in your spirit, Holy Spirit prayer language. So I got all this time on my hand, nothing except just up the hill, down the hill, load the bucket, dump the bucket. I'm going to pray. One night, I'd been praying for between three and four hours in tongues. Make no mistake about it, folks. Praying in the Spirit is the doorway into the supernatural. That people can make fun all they want. It's the doorway into the supernatural. I've been praying between three and four hours just as hard and fast as I could pray. Praying in my prayer language. Didn't know what I was praying for. Didn't matter. I'm just doing what the Bible says. He that prays in an unknown tongue edifies himself. I'm just, I'm just seeking God. I want God to straighten out my life. And I'm letting him edify me on the inside, praying in my spirit language. And so I'm headed down the hill, driving down the hill, headed for that bin to dump the bucket. And I'm praying in tongues. And all of a sudden, somebody got in the end loader with me. I could feel them right here. And it was like fire. And immediately I jammed on the brakes, clenched my eyes shut because I knew who it was. I'm telling you, the presence of God came in that cab with me. I mean, the presence of God. And, and I knew on the inside, I don't know how I knew it, but I just knew that Jesus himself had just gotten in that cab with me. I clenched my eyes shut and I began to tremble and I was scared to death. I'm telling you, afraid. I was shaken and I began to pray, oh, Jesus, Jesus, please, please, please do not appear to me. I will die with a heart attack. Do not do it. Do not do it. I mean, I was afraid. I thought if I look over there, he's going to be there and all that blazing glory. I'm gonna, and I'll just die. I'll just, I'm too skinny. I'll die. I was scared to death. I said, I, I mean, I was since I'm, I'm, I'm being serious. Please, Jesus, don't appear to me. I'll look the other way. I wouldn't even look over there. I'm, I'm over here, and I got my eyes clenched shut, except, you know, when you shut your eyes, but you still see the light through the lids. It looks red. That's what it looked like. And there was this fire over here. It wasn't physically hot, but I knew there was a presence, a heavenly presence here. And I'm just, I just had that, my foot on the brake. I'm halfway down the hill. I'm looking this way with my eyes shut, saying, please, please don't appear to me. And he began to speak. And he quoted a verse of scripture right from the Bible, verbatim. Then another one, then another one. For about 10, 12 minutes, he quoted Bible verses to me. I heard them in my heart, not in my ear. Verse after verse, passage after passage. Between, I estimate, 30 to 45 scriptures. And then he stopped. And then the whole cab became cool feeling and dark again. I opened my eyes and sure enough, he was gone. Jesus laced scriptures together and gave me a revelation of redemption and of salvation that countered and cured me from a false doctrinal heresy. A heresy I had held on to. I held on to it with, to, with, for dear life. I would argue with people to know it till, till three in the morning over it. But I was wrong. It was a false doctrine. And that night in that cab, Jesus set me free from a false doctrine that would have proven to be theologically destructive to my whole ministry. Later, I'm walking across a platform, months later, praying again, reading my New Testament. And all of a sudden, I'm walking across this platform, and I stepped, whoa, I could tell... I'm stepping on the inside of somebody already standing there. I looked, it was nobody there, but yet somebody was there. I couldn't see them, but I couldn't see behind them. I'm looking eyeball to eyeball with a heavenly visitor again, and I'm convinced when he began to speak, it was Jesus again. You know what he said to me? I remember it word for word. It's real brief. But he released me to begin my speaking ministry this night. He looked at me in the eye and he said, blessing I will bless you multiplying, I will multiply you, go and preach the gospel. And then he disappeared. He was gone. One week later, my pastor who I served in the ministry of helps, cleaning the bathrooms, vacuuming the carpets. One week later, my pastor called me and said, the Lord spoke to me, said, you're ready to preach. Do you want to preach this Sunday night? Preach my first Sunday, the following Sunday night after Jesus spoke to me on that platform. Another time, 
I'm working with some boys and they're making fun of me because I believe in healing and miracles. and I believe in the baptism and the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. Oh, they had a big time with me. Eh, you know, love-hate relationship. I ate lunch with them. We worked together. But man, they made fun of me. They didn't want no part of me. So I was kind of an outcast. One night, I'm about to leave, get off, sh- off midnight shift at that place. And this young man comes up to me and said, David, he's looking around. Would you pray for me? I said, for what? He said, I've got this toothache. It's killing me. Would you pray for me? I said, no, I'm not praying for you. <laughs> Turkey, you make fun of me all the time. You always jeering and laughing with all those guys about my faith. I'm not praying for you. Picked up my lunch bucket. I headed for the parking lot. I got about halfway to the parking lot, and the Lord spoke to me and said, Who do you think you are? (laughs) Again, I'm playing dumb. Huh? What? (laughs) Who do you think you are to refuse to pray for someone that asks you for prayer? You, it sounded like my mama, you get yourself back up that hill and pray for that boy. So here I come with my lunch bucket, back up the hill. I said, I looked at him, and now he's with four or five of these guys that make fun of me. I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll pray for you. I reached out, touched his cheek. I said, Lord, heal him of that toothache in Jesus' name, amen. Got my lunch bucket, took off. (laughs) (laughs) The next night I go to work, and that old boy, again, he's looking around, making sure nobody hears him. He comes up to me, he said, David? I said, yeah. He says, his eyes were as big as saucers. I, I have never seen anything like that. I said, what? He said, you didn't even touch me. The minute your hand got close to my jaw, that tooth quit hurting and it has never hurt anymore. God healed me. Now, uh, I could go on and on, but I'm already out of town. I got several things I got to say. Are you, still, are you okay? You okay? It's hot out there. Don't go out there. <laughs> Jesus showed up in my ditch. Jesus showed up in an end loader. Jesus showed up on that platform that night. Jesus showed up when I prayed for that boy. Now why? Am I special? Because I'm called to preach? A lot of people are called to preach and never had those kind of things happen. Am I just a specially favored one? Am I I the Lord's favorite? Am I just lucky? No, 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 no. In every one of those instances... I was obeying God. I obeyed His command to rejoice and leap for joy. I obeyed Him and prayed in my prayer language. I obeyed Him by studying, preparing myself in the ministry. And I obeyed, even though I didn't want to, I obeyed Him and prayed for that boy. And when I obeyed Him, He showed up. Obedience is getting a bad rep these days. People say, oh, if you preach on obedience, that's legalism. It's not legalism. That's law works. I'm not saying you have to obey God to be right with God or to get saved. But obedience is not legalism. Obedience, listen to me, obedience is how you show Jesus that you love Him. It's simple as that. Simple as that. It's an act of faith that can bring Jesus in your life in a, for a supernatural moment that can change your life. There was a blind man one day said, Jesus, heal me of my blindness. Jesus spit on the ground, made mud, rubbed it in his eyes, said, go, go wash out in that pool over there. He went and he washed his eyes out and he came back seeing. When he obeyed Jesus, Jesus showed up. Ten lepers one day, Jesus, cleanse us from our leprosy. He said, go to the temple, show yourself to the priest. He didn't pray for me, didn't touch him. He just said, go to the temple, show yourself to the priest. They began their journey to the temple. And as they went, the Bible says, they discovered that all 10 of them were cleansed from their leprosy. Jesus showed up when they obeyed what he said. Peter denied Jesus three times. But after Jesus' resurrection, he forgave Peter. And he said, Peter, you're still called to preach. I want you to feed my sheep. A few days later, day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. They spoke in tongues. A crowd gathered. What does all this mean? It was Peter that said, hmm, I believe this is my moment. I'm going to obey Jesus. He stepped out and he fed the sheep of God and told them what was going on and preached Jesus. And Jesus showed up and 3,000 Jews got saved. Because 
Peter obeyed the Lord. Oh, Pastor David, it's so hard to obey God. I mean, I don't think I can obey God. Let me tell you something. Jesus talked to a dead man one day. He'd been dead for four days. His name was Lazarus. And Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And here he came. He came forth. In every word or command of Jesus is the energy, the power, and the grace to actually do what he said and to see it bring forth fruit in your life. Listen to me. Listen to me. When Jesus gave a command to a dead man, he obeyed it. If a dead man can obey Jesus, you can obey Jesus. You can obey Jesus. Makes me want to dance again. Praise the Lord. Somebody give the Lord a shout. Come on, somebody. Hey. I said, hey. Isaiah said, if you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. You'll be blessed. In Philippians, Jesus made it work. He became, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 that even Jesus became obedient unto death. He died in obedience to the Father. What, did, what happened? The Father showed up three days later and raised him from the dead because he obeyed God. <laughs> obedience is the key to Jesus showing up. Peter said in Acts 5 that God gives the Holy Spirit to them that obey him. 1994, God spoke to me and said, I want you to do a crusade in Honduras in every medium and large city. I didn't know what it would cost. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know where to get the help. I didn't know how, anything about it. But we as a church just began to obey that. We did our 60th crusade. We finished that mandate last March. Can I tell you something? Jesus showed up in every one of those 60 cities and healed the sick and he made the blind to see and the lame to walk and he drove out demons. And people got saved. Why? Because when we obey Him, He comes and loves on us. I love my girls. I love my grandkids. i got seven grandkids. I love them all. But I'm not always with them. They're not always at my house. I'm not always with their house. I love them all the time. Amen? But when they come to my house, I get sugar. I get to kiss them on the cheeks. I get to hug them up and set them on my lap, right? I get to love on them. See, Jesus said, if you'll love me, I will love you. He loves everybody, we think. Oh, yeah, he's not talking about his general love for everybody. He's saying, I'm going to do something special. I'm going to love on you like you've never been loved on before if you'll love me and if you'll obey me. Come on, somebody, give the Lord some praise. Hey! Jesus never does anything for me, Pastor David. Have you tried obedience? Not half obedience like King Saul and still had his kingdom ripped from him. No, no, no. Full obedience. He halfway obeyed God and the prophet came along and said, halfway obedience is not obedience and your stubbornness is just like witchcraft. We want to know why God can't bless us, and yet we're operating in witchcraft every time we only half obey God. And if you're only 10% or 0% obeying God, then what's going on there? I love you. I'm not here to get on to you. I'm here to show you the way out. If you'll obey God, Jesus will show up for you. I'm telling you, that's His promise. If you'll obey Him, He will show up for you. What has Jesus told you to do? Well, you stand. The piano's playing. You got to stand up. Come on. <laughs> what has Jesus told you to do? Well, He's never spoke to me. Well, you got a Bible. What does He say in the Bible? Do you do that? Do you go to church? Well, I went today. No, I'm talking about do you go to church? Do you read His Word? Do you pray? Do you seek His face? I need God to show up my finances. Okay. Are you obeying Him with your money? I need Jesus to show up in my marriage, okay? Are you obeying Him by respecting your husband and loving your wife like Christ loved the church? I need God to show up and just show up and answer my prayers, okay? Well, are you claiming His promises and believing them until He comes to and brings it to pass? Are you hanging on to Jesus until He shows up in your life? If you just say, Lord, help me, and well, it didn't happen immediately, I guess he's not going to do it. And then you turn to evolution and unbelief and all of the naysayers and all of the critics and, and you go fellowship with them. Come on, somebody, give God a chance to bless you. 
Give him a chance. What has he told you to do? In his word, he says, forgive those that hurt you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Do you do that? He says, rejoice and jump for joy when you're in a ditch and believe that God's about to show up and rescue you and double your salary from two to four dollars an hour. Come on, somebody, give the Lord a hand clap. Yeah. <laughs> that young man rode that pickup. I had that old Ford. Since then, I've driven a Lexus, I've driven a BMW, I've driven a Cadillac. Ah, you know, they're okay, but right now I'm driving a brand new shiny black Ford pickup truck. <laughs> it's nice. I said, it's real nice. I just enjoy my pickup. Special. Jesus will treat you special. Jesus will come to you. Jesus will help you. Jesus will heal you. Jesus will lead you, guide you. Jesus will show up for you. He may show up in your bedroom. He may show up at your workplace. He may show up in your prayer closet. I don't know where he's going to show up, but I'm telling you, I'd take that promise if I were you. I'd lay hold of that promise and claim that promise and say, God, just tell me what to do and I'll do it because what I need most in my life is for you to show up in me. Show up for me. Amen, somebody? Amen. Praise the Lord. Listen to this. Listen to this. Listen to this old hymn. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Sing it with me. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. One more time. Trust and obey for there's no other way to get Jesus to show up but to trust and obey. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. Praise the Lord. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes. What has Jesus told you to do? What has He said in His Word to do that you haven't been doing? What has He told you by His Spirit to do? You haven't done it yet. But you recognize there is that one hang-up you've got. There's that thing that He's told you to do, and you're not doing it. But today you say, Pastor, I'm going to do it. Because in His command is the divine grace to actually do it. You can do it. Oh, people say, I'm doing my best. God never asked you to do your best, never commanded you to do your best. He commands us to obey Him. The best is not good enough. Obedience is what opens the door to the visitation of God. Pastor David, I decide today I'm going to obey Him. Put your hand up in the air. We're going to pray a prayer. Put it up in the air with praise. Up in the air recognizing I'm going to obey God. I'll make a decision. Come on, say this right out loud. Lord Jesus, You've been speaking to me by Your Word and by Your Spirit. I choose to obey You. I'm going to do it. And I'm believing that You will show up in my life. Amen. And amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We believe it. We believe it. This week we sent out a message to folks that are reaching out to us, and then they reached out to us again on Facebook. And we told, told and some of you may have uh, been a recipient of that special message. We told you that pastors would pray for you right after this service, right here at the altar. Pastor Adam and I will be right here. If you need us to pray for you, maybe you need healing. Maybe you need direction. I don't know. Maybe you need comfort. You need a deliverance from an addiction. We're going to be right here in the 18 minutes before the next service starts. We'll be right here available to pray for you. We'd love to do it. Everybody, welcome Candace. Thank you.